the two of us were sort of a novelty at the Bassett show ring. People who just came to watch the shows and not participate. That helped us stand out in the crowd when it came to getting another Basset Hound puppy. Bloat could possibly kill your Basset. If you're passionate about Basset Hounds, this podcast is for you. This is Wobegon, the Basset Hound Podcast. I'm your host, Don Bullock. Hi everyone, I'm Don. My wife Pam and I have had Basset Hounds over 45 years. We've shown many to their AKC championships and post-2011 Grand Championships. Before I get into this episode, I'd like to mention something very disturbing to me that I've noticed. YouTube has decided to place ads for Basset Hound breeders in the search results for this podcast. Unfortunately, I have absolutely no control over this issue. I know nothing about these breeders and certainly don't recommend them. I'm very sorry that these ads are there, but YouTube is owned by Google, and they make the vast majority of their money tracking people and selling ads they think people want to see. Obviously, Google doesn't have any qualifications that these breeders must meet. Later in this episode, I'll explain what I consider to be requirements for a good breeder. Now to the story of the first Basset Hound we purposely got to show. Even though our stint with showing Chili ended after his third show, Pam and I were hooked. I must add that I was more interested in getting a show dog than Pam was, but she did want another well-bred Basset Hound puppy. Even though we weren't showing, Pam and I still went to many of the shows. We got to know most of the Bassets, their owners, and breeders. The two of us were sort of a novelty at the Bassett show ring, people who just came to watch the shows and not participate. That helped us stand out in the crowd when it came to getting another Basset Hound puppy. One day, we were approached by Sue Shoemaker of Shoefly Bassets. She asked us if we might be interested in getting a puppy from them to show. Pam and I were very impressed with the quality of their dogs, especially their temperament. They had some of the sweetest dogs outside the ring, so we responded, yes, we were interested. Over the next few months, we talked more with Sue about the possibility of her and her husband, Andy, having a litter when we had summer off from teaching. Yes, (laughs) that was still a big issue because as school teachers, we just couldn't take time off from work to raise a puppy. Toward the spring of 1992, Sue mentioned to us that they were planning a litter and might have a puppy for us. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with breeding, there's a big difference between planning a litter and having a puppy for someone. First of all, not all breedings take. Just because you put two dogs together and breed them doesn't mean the breeding will be successful. Second, When a breeding is successful, litter sizes range from one to maybe 10 or more puppies. A breeder doesn't know the actual count until the litter is whelped and they're several weeks old. Then the possibility of a puppy being what the breeder considers show quality lessens the possibilities too of getting a show dog. Anyway, getting a puppy from the shoemakers that we could show was a possibility. We just had to wait to see what happened each step of the way. Sue constantly kept us updated. Our excitement grew with each update. Fortunately, Sue and Andy did have a nice litter on May 11, 1992, with a puppy they were considering selling to us as a show prospect. I have no idea how many trips we made between our home and theirs. We just went back and forth almost every weekend. It seems like we did it every other weekend, but I'm not sure. Fortunately, the shoemakers welcomed our visits. Their home was about an hour away. The puppy was beautiful. I'm calling him the puppy because I can't remember his puppy name. He had a lot of qualities that I admired in Chile. 
One weekend, we arrived at the shoemaker's home early on Saturday morning. We had arranged to take the puppy home for the weekend. I remember Sue explaining that he might cry or even scream a little during the trip because he'd never ridden in a car. Well, <laughs> she was right. I didn't know a puppy could be that loud for so long. He never let up during the whole hour plus ride to our house. We used the same setup that we'd used for Chili when we brought him home, an exercise pin in our family room. Pam and I spent the whole weekend with the puppy. Yes, we skipped church choir duties again. As planned, we took the puppy back to the shoemaker's Sunday afternoon. On the trip back, he barked and screamed for about half the trip. <laughs> the rest of the time, he slept. The very next weekend, we drove in the shoemaker's driveway to take our puppy home to live. We were very excited and felt fortunate that he was going to be our dog. We signed the usual contract and paid for the puppy. The trip to our house was mostly uneventful. Sometime that day, Pam and I decided on a name. We were still going to church and singing in the choir, Following the shoe fly basset's tradition of naming all their males after brands of liquor wasn't a good choice for us because the church we went to was a Baptist church where drinking is frowned on. Also, the fact we were elementary school teachers figured into the choice as well. We still thought that keeping the tradition going was a way of thanking and honoring the shoemakers. After some thought, we came up with shoe flies Samuel Adams. <laughs> yeah, that's a beer name, and of course, it's also the name of a famous American. The shoemakers and the Basset Hound folks would understand that we were keeping to their tradition, and everyone else would think we were being patriotic. Sam, as we called him, was a wonderful boy. I took him to several matches after he was old enough, and he did well. The judges at the matches thought he was an excellent basset hound, and he won at many of these matches, both at the breed and hound group levels. As with many puppies, Sam wasn't a great eater. Since we were showing him, we wanted to put a little more weight on him. Sue suggested what she called puppy balls, ground up puppy food mixed with yogurt and made into small balls of food. Pam spread out the balls of food on a cookie sheet. The trick worked. Sam ate his food one puppy ball at a time, and as I recall, we used this technique several times on reluctant eaters over the years. Sam's very first show, appropriately the Kennel Club of Beverly Hills show at the LA Sports Arena, went well until he spit up some foam from all the excitement as we entered the ring. Once he was in the ring, Sam acted like he was born to show. While we didn't win, it was a good experience for both of us. I continued showing Sam at matches and shows. He and I became a good team. He loved showing and all the attention that went with it. Showing made Sam happy. All was good until the first show of the following year. Now, some of you might get a little embarrassed of what I'm about to say, but please bear with me. The day before the show, Pam and I noticed that one of Sam's testicles had become enlarged. By the time we got to the show, it was very large. As soon as we saw Sue, we brought it to her attention. After examining Sam, Sue was devastated because she knew what had most likely happened. Those of you who don't show are probably wondering why Sue was devastated because maybe it was a major health issue. Well, actually it wasn't. It meant that eventually Sam would be unable to show. Pam and I knew this was the case as well. Just to make sure, we did have Sam examined by the veterinarian on the showgrounds immediately after talking with Sue. He confirmed Sue's fear. The condition is caused by the twisting or torsion of the sperm ducts. She had seen this happen in male bassets before. The reason this would eventually put an end to Sam's showing was because AKC's requirement that states a male which does not have two normal testicles in the scrotum may not compete and will be disqualified. 
Our vet confirmed the diagnosis and drained a lot of excess fluid from Sam's testicle. That decreased the size and made it close to normal. So we continued to show Sam until a judge finally disqualified him a few shows later. According to Sue, the judge was notorious for strictly following the rules. It was hard to stop showing because Sam loved the show so much. We could have waited for two more judges to disqualify Sam, but the end was inevitable. That was Sam's last show. Now, I know you're wondering why the AKC has such a rule and why judges check for compliance. It's due to the purpose for shows. Dog shows are where breeders prove the quality of their breeding stock. A dog that doesn't have both testicles is considered not good for breeding. Remember, shows were where breeding stock is evaluated. That's also why neuter dogs and spayed bitches can't show, but that's a topic for a future episode. Some of our friends, including Sue and Andy, encouraged us to find a good home for Sam, since he could no longer be shown. We decided to keep him. Sam was an important part of our family, and he brought a lot of joy to our home. Sam continued to be an important part of our pack. He was a wonderful boy, and he got along well with all our other Bassets. We truly enjoyed having Sam around the house. As I mentioned in episode four, Sam was part of the howling trio that won the contest at the Basset Hound Club of Southern California Basset Hound Picnic. That's the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. Oh, that's wonderful. A, B, and C. <laughs> A, B, and C. This is serious business. Who is going to win the howling contest at this year's Bassett Hound Picnic? Boy, this is going to be a tough one. So the trio win! Sam's on the right. I also dressed him up one year in a red, white, and blue patriotic outfit. We won first place for that one, and a photo of him in the outfit made the front cover of the local newspaper. Yeah, that was back when being on the front page of newspapers was a big thing. Now, you would just put him on Facebook. Eventually, when Sam turned six, even though he was neutered, he was allowed to participate in specialty shows as a veteran. While the concept here is to allow people to show their neutered and spayed champions, an AKC championship is not a requirement. Because Sam loved to show, I entered him in the veteran sweepstakes at the first specialty where he was eligible. Sam won best in veteran sweepstakes. I continued to do that for several years, and most of the time, Sam either won best in veteran sweepstakes or best of opposite sex in veteran sweepstakes. Sam and I both had a blast in the show ring. While dogs can't truly smile, Sam would have if he could. It's too bad that there were so few specialty shows for Sam to compete in. Unfortunately, we lost Sam to bloat. Pam and I left him in the morning when we went to work and found him dead in his doghouse when we got home. I'm sorry to be so blunt, but that's what happened. There's no way to describe our feelings at the time. Losing one of our dogs has always been hard on both of us. This was worse. Well, hi, Lex. You decided to come visit me, huh? Yeah. Well, I haven't started recording yet. Well, I sort of recording this. Yeah. Good girl. Sorry for that little interruption from Lexi. She's our needy girl, and she just wanted some tummy hugs. Since I mentioned we lost Sam to bloat, I thought I need to explain what it is, how it happens, and possible prevention. It's something that every Basset Hound owner should know about. Bloat could possibly kill your Basset. According to the Basset Hound Club of America, bloat is a devastating twisting of the stomach that can quickly lead to hypervolemic shock. That's a hard word. To death. It's a potential danger to Basset Hounds. 
owners should be able to recognize its symptoms and diminish potential predisposing factors. End quote. This is a place where I need to insert some actual medical information on what bloat is that's not my opinion. When the stomach is filled with air, fluid, or food, it's considered bloat. Bloat is extremely uncomfortable and it can put pressure on other organs and cause difficulty breathing. However, the term bloat when used with dogs is generally referring to a much more critical condition called gastric dilation vulvomus, or GDV. Much easier to say. GDV happens when bloated stomach becomes twisted in the abdomen. This causes great tension on internal organs and often leads to partial or total restriction of blood supply to other tissues. Suppression of the cardal vena cava, a large vein that returns blood to the heart, can very quickly lead to shock. Even when treated, which usually requires surgery where the vet goes in and untwists the stomach, it's estimated that up to 40% of GDV cases result in death. There's a link in the description with all this information. That, in a nutshell, is what they say is canine bloat. It seems to occur more often in deep-chested dogs, which a basset essentially is. But canine bloat, or GDV, can happen in any breed. I'm sure you're immediately wondering what causes canine bloat and how it can be prevented. Neither of these questions is easy to answer. Thus, the reason bloat happens. The exact cause for canine bloat is unknown. There are a lot of theories, but far too many cases go against those theories. Bloat can happen at any time. When it occurs, quick treatment gives the dog the highest success rate, but as stated above, it's not always successful. I have a friend whose Afghan hound died from bloat on the operating table during a rather minor surgical procedure for something else. Certainly, the veterinarian's response was quick, but he wasn't able to save the dog. It's extremely important to know the early symptoms of bloat. Remember, almost half the cases caught early enough to receive veterinary treatment still result in death. GDV is a true emergency. The earlier you can recognize the signs, the better. Symptoms to watch out for include dis distended or swollen stomach, sudden lethargy or restlessness and pacing, weakness, excessive salivation, unsuccessful attempts at vomiting, pale mucous membranes such as the gums, shortness of breath, or collapse. In my opinion, it's always better to be safe than sorry when getting the dog to the veterinarian. GDV is a medical emergency that needs immediate veterinary treatment. Taking your dog to the vet at the first sign of the symptoms can possibly save your dog's life. I decided to interject here something that came up after I'd finished recording this episode. One of our Bassett's Magnum that's owned by a friend bloated. As seems to often be the case, it happened in the middle of the night. Our friend rushed him to the closest emergency hospital. According to the x-ray, his stomach had twisted, so our friend authorized the necessary surgery. Fortunately, the surgery was successful and Magnum is doing well. According to the veterinarian, he's doing better than expected. Unfortunately, Magnum's spleen was involved in the process of twisting of the stomach, so it had to be removed during the surgery. Our friend will now have to consult with his veterinarian to see what he needs to do as a result. Removal of the spleen is not a rare situation, so Magnum should be able to live a fairly normal life without one. Oh, and in case you're wondering, he's 10. I thought this was important for you to know that canine bloat surgery can be successful by providing this actual case. Please understand that if a dog actually bloated, such visits and the treatment for canine bloat at an emergency vet facility 
is likely to be very expensive. In most cases, surgery may be required, but only the attending veterinarian can make that determination. In recent years, the cost has skyrocketed for bloat surgery in many areas from hundreds of dollars to multiple thousands. I know that from personal experience with it. If you have pet insurance on your dog, it may or may not cover the cost of canine bloat. That's something you might want to check on beforehand. GDV is a devastating experience, and veterinarians around the world are trying to figure out what causes bloat and how it can be prevented. Until that happens, you can limit the risks and keep your extra eye out on your basset. It also might be a good idea to start a special savings account for pet-related emergencies. We have one that we've used on several occasions. There are a whole list of possible things that dog owners can do to hopefully prevent canine bloat. I've seen many different forms of these lists and even have one posted on our wobegonbassets.com website. You can refer to that if you're interested. I'll post a link to it in the description. Since there is no way of knowing what causes bloat, these lists are mostly just guesses. They are not to be considered veterinary advice. One source of information on canine bloat that I recommend can be found on the website of the Basset Hound Club of America. A prominent veterinarian from the University of California, Davis, gave a presentation on GDV or canine bloat during the 2015 BHCA Nationals in Sacramento. He provided the Basset Hound Club of America with a PDF containing the images on his PowerPoint presentation which has been posted on their website. Unfortunately, the presentation wasn't recorded, so a lot of the information was lost. But the PowerPoint presentation might help you. One of the things that this veterinarian and others suggest is tacking the stomach or prophylactic gastroplexy. This is a surgical procedure that attaches or tacks the stomach lining to the abdomen. This often is done in high-risk breeds such as basset hounds and can help keep the bloated stomach from twisting. While this surgery can't prevent bloat, it's very important to remember that it can possibly help prevent the most serious form. The emphasis word here is possibly. There are no guarantees. Before I end this segment, I need to state that I am not a licensed veterinarian. I'd suggest that all of you who don't know much about canine bloat, or even if you think you know a lot about it, to consult your veterinarian on this condition and possibly research the topic from reliable sources such as the links on the BHCA website. Remember, just because something appears on the internet, it's not necessarily accurate or truthful. I personally read and heard a lot of false information on canine bloat, including remarks from some of my breeder friends. I know one dog food company whose representative claimed that their food would prevent bloat with absolutely no research, much less conclusive evidence to back up that statement. With the influx of artificial intelligence generators cranking out information on the internet, being careful where information comes from is even more important. I realize I may have mispronounced some of the words in the segment on bloat. Use the links in the description if you need to know more about them. I greatly appreciate the Basset Hound Club of America for their outstanding website and health research committee and other efforts to keep the health information updated. I feel it's important to state here that I do not speak for the BHCA. I'm just a member that uses them as a resource for accurate information for this podcast. In episode three, I sort of left you hanging when I said in France at this time, every smooth coated basset hound was called a basset Francais, and that two strains, the Chin Artus and the basset Normand, were eventually combined to produce the predecessor of the basset hound. There was not a breed called Basset Hound at the time. I'm sure some of you were wondering what I meant by all that and how the breed was named. 
Well, it goes back to the Paris Dog Show and the British enthusiasts who attended the show. Remember that I previously stated that the breed we know today was developed in Britain, not France. The Basset Hound was not well known to the British sportsmen before 1863, in which year specimens of the breed were seen at the first French exhibition of dogs held in Paris, as I mentioned in episode three. The showing of at least two strains of French Bassets at the show caused general curiosity and admiration among the English visitors. In France, short-legged hounds had been used for generations. The British who attended Paris show instead were using beagles to hunt rabbit and hare. According to the Basset Hound Club in the United Kingdom or Britain, quote, the Basset as we know them today arrived officially in Great Britain in 1866. 1866 was a very important year for the Basset Hounds as a specific breed as we know them today. Lord Galway of Cerebri imported two examples, Basset and Bell, from the well-respected kennels of Count Le Colt du Cantalou, a famous French hound enthusiast. In a letter from Lord Galway to Major C. Hinseltine, the first mention of Basset Hound as the name for the breed appeared in British literature. That year was also considered to be the first introduction of Basset Hounds in England and their continued breeding on a scientific basis began." End quote. This is all documented in Lord Galway's letter to Hinseltine. In it, he stated, quote, in July 1866, I was staying at the Royal Pay de Dome, France, where I met Marquis de Turin and his son, Come de Turin. The latter promised me a pair of basset hounds from his pack, which duly arrived in the autumn at Serby. They were a dog and bitch, and I called them Basset and Bell. They were long, low hounds shaped much like a dachshund with crooked front legs at the knees and with much more bone and larger heads than beagles. They were not the dark tan color of dachshunds, but the color of foxhounds with a certain amount of white about them. They had deep, heavy tongues, more like foxhounds than beagles." End quote. Now, for my listeners, tongue here refers to the bark when hunting. Notice Lord Galway called them basset hounds. This is the first time this name was used for the breed in literature. While the name basset hound wasn't widely used for the breed at the time, it eventually became their official name. The reference to the first scientific breeding mentioned in the letter was due to the fact that records of breedings of Basset Hounds started with Basset and Bell. While not all breedings were recorded like they are today, we do know about many of them, especially those that were important to the establishment of our breed. As mentioned previously, eventually the breedings of purebred dogs were recorded in stud books. Of great importance is the statement that these two were the first Bassets to be introduced in Britain. That leads to my standard myth for this episode. I'm sure some of you have always thought the following passage from Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream has to be describing Basset Hounds. I've seen many statements to that effect. Quote, My hounds are bred out of the Spartan kind, so flued, so sanded, and their heads are hung with ears that sweep away the morning dew. End quote. According to some researchers, Shakespeare was instead referring to water spaniels. They can't seem to agree as to whether or not it was Spanish water spaniels or the extinct English water spaniel. In Britain during Shakespeare's time, spaniels were used the way hounds were being used in Europe. Personally, I think these researchers are all wet, meaning they really don't know. Neither of these spaniels has long ears. If Basset Francais were actually in Britain prior to 1866, 
they were definitely not what we call Basset hounds today. Some scholars suggest they were possibly Talbot hounds. These low hounds were certainly known about in England, possibly coming from France after the conquest. Several families of Norman descent, such as the Earl of Shrewsbury, have white Talbot hound on their coat of arms. Some others maintain that there are written records of exchanges of hounds between England and France. In 1305, Edward, the first Prince of Wales, allegedly sent his cousin, Louis X of France, quote, some of our low-legged hare hounds from Wales, end quote. This is from a letter attributed to Edward. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a copy of the original letter. The fact that I found two totally different references to it raises to the credibility of its existence. These short-legged hounds that Edward mentioned in his letter could have been the dogs that are depicted on a carved Welsh cupboard that has been attributed to the 1500s. Some dogs are depicted on this cupboard. There seems to be a greyhound or similar sight hound on the left of the top rail, a deer in the center, and a breed of low-slung scent hound on the right. On the rail below the center carved area depicting three people is a whole row of these low-slung short-legged hounds. The row is broken up with what appears to be the image of a rabbit. These hounds seem to be specifically of Welsh type. According to one source in the 15th century, they may have been Cornish hounds in England, which were described as heavy-built, very short-legged, with long ears and deep voices. It's very likely that these were introduced from over the channel by visitors from Brittany. I couldn't find any sources to collaborate this source. The fact that I couldn't find another source to collaborate this information is compounded by the fact that I couldn't find illustrations of such a hound. No matter what actually happened, dogs in these scenarios were not basset hounds as some claim. Remember that in episode one, I mentioned there were at least a dozen basset breeds in France alone and more elsewhere in the rest of Europe. I'm sticking with the statement that the Basset Hound Club of England made that our modern Basset Hounds are based on imports from France, which began in 1866 with Lord Galway. With his purchase of Bell, Lord Galway became the first breeder of what he called Basset Hounds and the beginning of the breed called Basset Hounds that we have today. Now, for those of you watching the YouTube version, you may have noticed that in the last segment, I wasn't wearing my headphones. I'm doing that now to try to help the sound. I want to improve the sound quality of this podcast. Before I get into talking about breeders, I need to first of all establish what a breeder is. According to the AKC and all the other major fully recognized dog registries, a breeder is the owner of a female or bitch that has been bred, or there's someone who has leased a bitch from another breeder. While this may sound strange to some, it's the way things are. The owner of the male or the dog of a litter is not considered to be a breeder unless they also own or lease the bitch. As a result, someone who just offers stud services for breeders is not considered to be a breeder. Since I've told you about how to find a good breeder by going to dog shows and what to expect at dog shows, I thought in this episode I need to address the concept of a reputable, responsible breeder. Now, as I mentioned in episode three, we found a reputable, responsible breeder by going to a dog show. In my opinion, that's the first criterion for this category of breeders. They use the AKC show ring to prove the quality of their dogs based on the standard for their breed. Most of the dogs they breed have at least an AKC championship. The only exception for this would be if you're looking for a dog for a specific purpose, such as hunting or field trials or something like that, in such cases, a breeder still should be able to prove that their dogs are successful at what they're bred to do. I know some of you will disagree here, but even such cases, the breeder should be using the breed standard as a guide to their breeding. 
I use the words reputable and responsible for these breeders for specific reasons. Since Pam and I retired from breeding, I received many requests from people wanting me to help them find a reputable breeder. The most common definitions for reputable include having a good reputation, honored, trustworthy, or respectable. All of those things can be said of a good breeder. A breeder with a good reputation is one you hear about usually through word of mouth. Other breeders know them and their dogs and recommend them when they don't have puppies available or they're breeders to whom the breeder might go to for a stud service. These breeders are honored within the breeding community. Those honors include AKC championships and other titles that they've earned with their dogs. Trustworthy pertains to the way these breeders work with other breeders and those who purchase their puppies. Other breeders can trust these breeders to be honest with them about the faults and issues they may have in their bloodlines or a specific dog that the other breeder is considering using for breeding purposes. More importantly, these breeders are honest with those who are interested in their puppies. They don't exaggerate the qualities or hide things from puppy buyers. If a puppy has a fault based on the standard of their breed, they let the buyers know that. More importantly, they are truthful in regards to the possible health issues. These breeders don't sell dogs as show dog unless they're certain the puppy has the necessary qualities. Having said that, they also make it clear that things can change as the dog matures, and the breeder can't really predict or control that. Responsible is an adjective that AKC often uses to describe a good breeder. According to the dictionary, responsible includes all the aspects for someone who's reputable that I just covered. In addition, responsible implies the satisfactory performance of one's duties, as well as being accountable for their actions and decisions. A responsible breeder is one who wants to know what happens to their puppies and is always available to these puppy owners if issues or questions arise. They thoroughly question puppy buyers to assure themselves that their puppies will have good homes. In addition, responsible breeders make sure that their dogs never enter shelters or other organizations that rescue dogs. They require that puppies are returned to them if the owner can no longer care for them. These breeders are then responsible to find new homes or to care for the puppy themselves. In essence, these breeders are responsible for the best possible life of their dogs they breed and for the dog's entire life. Responsibility also relates to breeders doing their best to breed purebred dogs as close to the AKC standard or the standard recognized in their country. That means that the breeder knows the standard and tries to match the sire and the dom of a litter to breed puppies that will come close to the standard as possible. Breeding to the standard is a combination of science and intuition. The science of genetics is important in breeding and is a good topic for another episode. A good breeder should know the basics of genetics and related to the breeding of dogs and the use them when selecting breeding stock. In my opinion, intuition is just as important to breeding. That's because the goal for each litter should be to maintain the qualities of the breed and where possible, improve the characteristics of the breed and what it should be. While knowing the science of genetics can guide the breeder, there's an art to breeding as well. The breeder needs to be able to intuitively predict what the outcome of the breeding will be. As I've mentioned in other episodes, part of the responsibility of a breeder is to avoid diseases and other similar issues that can arise when breeding dogs. This is a must. I've already mentioned Lephora, open angle glaucoma, and genetic tests for them that breeders should perform on their dogs. There's also a genetic test for a bleeding disorder called thrombopathia. This disorder is present in basset hounds, but is not nearly as prevalent as glaucoma or Lephora. When it does occur, dogs with this disorder can easily bleed to death. MPS1, which is something I'm not even going to try to pronounce, 
has been clinically and genetically confirmed in Basset hounds, while MPS1 usually manifests itself in puppies around six to eight weeks of age, most effective puppies do not survive. As a result, puppy buyers, except those who plan to breed their puppy, will most likely not be affected. It's still something breeders should test for. MPS1 could be a devastating to their breeding efforts. For more information on the responsibility of breeders in this area, I strongly recommend that you read the health policy of the Basset Hound Club of America and hold any breeder, even if they aren't BHCA members, accountable for following this policy. If puppy buyers don't hold breeders accountable, they may purchase puppies that are more likely to become affected with health issues and will continue to see the issues in our breed. That policy can be found on the BHCA website at basset-bhca.org. Essentially, that's the basics for a good breeder. In my opinion, all of them need to be present. Breeding purebred dogs is not as easy as it looks, and even some who have bred dogs don't understand that. I have a great friend who rescues and cares for Basset Hounds who calls these breeders guardians of the breed. She feels that these breeders are doing their best to keep the breed going by breeding good examples of the breed. According to her, they also work at improving the breed. She feels that without these breeders, Basset Hounds would eventually disappear. And I fully agree. Now, I know some of you out there feel I'm totally wrong on one or more of my points. Well, everyone's responsible for their own views and decisions. I've chosen to make the statements here that I feel are the things to be considered for someone to be considered a good breeder of Basset Hounds. This is also what I consider to be the minimum requirements. I strongly feel that belonging to a local Basset Hound Club, if one's available, and the Basset Hound Club of America are also important. Those organizations have codes of ethics that their members are expected to follow. Ethics in breeding is very important. Joining one of these organizations usually requires a breeder to be reputable as well because most of the clubs require sponsorship for one of more club members for membership in the organization. I know some people state they won't join a club because of the politics in the organization. That's not an excuse. By getting involved in such an organization, a breeder can easily become one who changes those club politics. There are many opportunities in these organizations where help is needed, and I suggest that you get into one and help out. Parent clubs like the BHCA are the organizations that are recognized by the AKC to write and maintain the standards for their breeds and to be the chief advocate for their breed within the AKC. Local Basset Hound clubs themselves must be members of the BHCA. Both are important for maintaining and improving our breed. Another important requirement I place on reputable, responsible breeders is supporting Basset Hound rescue groups. While a reputable, responsible breeder, as I mentioned above, should be responsible for their Bassets to prevent them from ending up in shelters or in need of being rescued, they should be active in assisting rescue efforts for their breed. That support could be direct involvement in rescue efforts, financial support, or a combination of both, but they need to get involved somehow. There are some excellent videos on the AKC website on the topic of responsible breeders that I highly recommend. If possible, I'll link to some of them in the description in the show notes. Pam and I also created a video on reputable responsible breeders that I posted on our website, and it's also published on the YouTube channel where this podcast is published. A link to that video will be included in the descriptions and the show notes. A listener to the podcast who wishes to remain anonymous has emailed me the following question, which I think is very important for all of my listeners. What advice would you give to a beginner in general who wants to keep showing and learning as an owner handler and maybe someday a breeder handler? 
Well, my responses also aim to anyone interested in showing a dog. Before I even start answering the question, I need to say, be prepared to lose a lot. There are far more losers at dog shows than winners. Being prepared to lose is an important and it makes winning even more exciting. You need to understand that I'm not saying that you should go into the ring with a defeatist attitude, just the opposite. Enter the ring with the attitude that your dog is good enough to win and present the dog as if it's already a winner. But understand, you still may lose. <laughs> now on to my answer. What an excellent question, but it's very complex. First of all, the dog you're showing is extremely important. If possible, source your Basset Hound from a reputable, responsible breeder. They, by definition, will be honest with you on the qualities of your dog. I know, however, this isn't possible in a lot of places. While finding a Basset worthy of showing from a breeder who doesn't show is possible, it's not something that I can recommend. No matter where you source your Basset Hound, it's necessary to compare your dog with the AKC standard. Knowing the good qualities of your Basset Hound as well as its faults based on the standard is very important to showing. Remember, there's no such thing as a perfect dog. You need to be honest with yourself in relation to the quality of your dog. This will pay off later when you decide to breed if you do. Even before you have a dog, you can actually get started with showing. Whenever you're at a dog sale, I suggest that you watch the experienced handlers and the judges pattern very closely. Far too often, I see those who are new to showing or even experienced handlers not paying attention to what's happening in the ring and not knowing the judges pattern for judging. These handlers tend to make the same mistake over and over again. According to many professional handlers I've talked to over the years, Basset Hounds are one of the most difficult breeds to show. Where possible, attending a handling class with a teacher who is familiar with Basset Hounds is the best place to start to learn how to handle a dog. Unfortunately, for most people, that's not possible. The second best way to learn to show is working with an experienced breeder, preferably one that you got the dog from. Again, in some cases, I know this isn't possible. This is where observing experienced handlers that I mentioned really comes into play. It may be the only way for a new exhibitor to learn proper and effective techniques. So you just need to watch very carefully and check and see why do they do particular things with their dog. You can watch these other handlers in person at dog shows or find some video clips from dog shows on the internet. I've seen many such videos on Facebook recently. And in recent years, breed judging at the Westminster Kennel Club dog show and similar shows has been recorded and put on the internet. I found some of these clips through doing a Google search. Certainly most handlers at that level are very experienced. Look at what these handlers do. What techniques do you notice that might help you the next time you're in the ring with your dog? Practicing those techniques you've observed between shows will help, but actual ring experience where you implement them is even more important. Sometimes practicing outside the ring doesn't always carry over into the ring, but at least you know the technique and how to implement that in the ring. Observing a judge's pattern for judging is also very important. While most judges do similar things with their judging, each one does things a little differently and sometimes in their own unique way. Not following what they want wastes time and may cause the judge to be less able to judge your dog. While most judges are very understanding when dealing with new exhibitors, some aren't. When I taught school, I always reminded my students to learn from their mistakes when showing everyone including those of us who have been doing it for a long time, makes mistakes. Learn from them. If it's helpful, have someone outside the ring observing and telling you later what they saw that you did right and wrong and make some suggestions. 
they see things that you aren't aware of. And just remember, they're trying to help. They're not really there to criticize you. There's a lot to remember when showing a Basset Hound. In stacking the Basset Hound, the things to remember include setting the front feet and the legs perpendicular to the ground, going to the rear and setting the rear feet where they belong, going back and checking the front, holding the head of the Basset well back towards the body to show off the neck and sternum, plus hopefully helping to keep the Basset from moving his front feet, a trick I learned many years ago. Raising the tail just before the judge turns towards the Basset and starts his observation and his examination. Getting a feel for when your Basset is just about to move a foot and either preventing that movement or putting the foot quickly back where it belongs. Getting your Basset to stand still when stacking. Keeping your dog stacked during the judge's examination. Showing the dog's bite to the judge. And while doing all of that, making sure that the top line of your Basset Hound is level to the ground. You also have to work on how to best get your Basset Hound on and off the ramp. And all of this is just for starters. There's much more to learn as you go along. Movement is also extremely important with a Basset Hound. Things like keeping the lead up just behind the ears and far up on the neck as possible Getting your Basset to move with its head up is expected by judges today. Learning the best pace for your particular Basset to show off his movement and using that speed when moving them in the ring, plus talking to the dog while moving him helps to keep the dog's attention. Remembering to follow the judge's directions for the pattern they want you to use on the down and back and going around the ring. Uh, those are all important. Now, remembering all that and improving where needed just seems to be overwhelming. Oh, yes, and when you do all that, remember to relax and smile like you're really enjoying being there. <laughs> the most important part of showing is to have fun. If it isn't fun for you, it's not worth it, and your dog will not show well. They can feel your emotions right through that lead all the way from you down to them. Now, don't worry about the breeder part just yet. Once you have many good experiences in the ring, you've earned your first AKC championship and shown a bitch to her championship, do you need to think about seriously about becoming a breeder? Remember, you must own a bitch to become a breeder. Hopefully, that bitch is one of high enough quality, according to the AKC standard, to be bred either to a male you own or to a champion that someone else is willing to allow you to use as a stud. That's far more than enough to get started. I'll cover more on this topic in the breeder handler part of the question in future episodes. Well, thank you very much to this listener and their question and some other questions that they had that I'll respond to in future podcasts. Here's the dog quote from this episode. Singer-songwriter Kinky Friedman says, Money can buy you a dog, but only love can make him wag his tail. That's for sure. Well, remember that thumbs up on YouTube if you watch the video version. It's very important. Those of you who listen to the podcast, a high rating wherever you listen to it is very important as well. Both help the podcast be recommended to others. Recommending the podcast to other Basset Hound owners and on Basset Hound related social media sites would greatly help as well. Future podcasts will be announced on our Wobegone Basset's Facebook page and Wobegone Basset's website, wobegonebasset.com. That's where you can also see the show notes, including photographs and links that go along with this episode. You can also leave your questions and comments through the website. Recording an audio question to be played on an episode or simply sending questions by email are options that are available on the website. In episode six of Wobegon, the Basset Hound podcast, I plan to cover the very first AKC champion that we had. The beginnings of the breed we call Basset Hounds today the beginnings of the standard for the breed, and more. Thank you all very much for listening.
Will Be Gone the Basset Hound podcast is published in visual form on YouTube the first Monday of every month. A full-length audio version of each episode is published one week later wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our Wobegon Bassett's website for show notes including photos from every episode. You can also find links to the podcast plus information on Don and his wife Pam plus their Bassett hounds. Wobegon the Bassett Hound podcast is produced, researched and hosted by Don Bullock. The music is Do Your Ears Hang Low played by Nasrality from the Philippines. It's available royalty free on Pixabay. Please give this podcast a thumbs up on YouTube and a high rating wherever you listen to podcasts. Until next time, this is Don. Thank you very much for listening.